<clears throat> Can we see the slides? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Shanzi. Good afternoon, Dr. Shanzi. We can see the slides. Yes, we can. Okay, so I thought this was important to have it in one place, like all surgical instruments that come on your OSCE exam, just to, to have all of them in one place that you can refer to and go back to. Uh, I know some instruments will be not something that you see every day, but it will be something you can refer to, you know, every time you have an exam and you want to look at surgical instruments. So I've just put all the things that come in your exam together so that we just quickly discuss them and then move on to the, to the next thing. So we all know what, uh, what this is, isn't it? This, these are... Um, obstetric forceps. This, the, this particular one on the screen are called Wrigley's, Wrigley's forceps. Uh, usually we use them when we are doing outlet forceps. So you know when you are delivering a baby, when the baby is, you can see the head of the baby on the valve, but it can't come out. These are the forceps we normally would use for, for that indication. Then on the um, right side of the slide, you can see that um, obstetric forceps, delivery forceps have parts. You have the handle, which is the part where you are holding and pulling. Um, then you have the shank, which is the part that connects the lock and the blade. Then you have a lock somewhere there between the handle and the shank where um, this thing gets locked so it doesn't get dislodged when you're pulling uh, when you're pulling the baby then you have the cephalic curve on the forceps which is the part that is in contact with the mother's pelvic bones and you have the cephalic curve which is the part that is holding onto the head so where it's written cephalic curve is where the baby's head is then we are pulling uh, the baby so when we do the next the next uh, presentation in a few minutes, you'll see how, how this normally works. But all you need to know is that you have these Wrigley's forceps there and your forceps have parts. So if somebody labels, what is this? What is that? You should be able to say, this is a lock. This is a handle. This, this is a shank. And these are blades, uh, like uh, delivery forceps are blades. So that's, that's what we have as, as our first slide. Then everyone knows what this is. We don't need to go around uh, talking about it. So this is your fetoscope. Uh, this is a cord scissors. Uh, cord scissors should never be missed because it has that round um, cutting part. We, we don't cut the cord with a straight thing because with a straight scissors because it slides on the cord. So this cord scissors is shaped in uh, such a way that when you are cutting around, uh, cord. It doesn't slide uh, over it. It just cuts it like that. So that is about the cord scissors, which we all know. Then uh, this is an episiotomy scissors. It's also something that uh, you should know. Um, of course, I'm putting them here because many times on the labor words, we are improvising. We don't have the correct instruments. Some people are using blades to cut the, uh, the to do episiotomies so this is there for you to see the correct instrument and then when it's there in your um, exam you can kind of identify it so you know it has this a uh, funny shape there to be able to go through the vagina and cut the outside uh, at the same time so that is why it's shaped like that then we have this uh, forcep which i know very few of you have seen, but if you look in the um, archives of our labor words, not even in the archives, where we keep instruments, you'll find this instrument. This is an Odham perforator. It's used uh, when we are doing um, destructive deliveries. So you can see on the left, it's closed. On the right, it's open. 
So I'm, I'm using those terms open and closed to refer to the tip. So what we use this instrument for is that when you have like an obstructed labor, the baby is dead, the baby is on the vulva, uh, you don't want to take this patient for C-section because you are thinking about a risk of infection because this woman has been in labor for a long time. We use um, this instrument, the way it is on the left side, you just go in the vagina, do a V, direct your fingers and just perforate the skull of the baby. Once you perforate the skull, then you close it the way it's closed on the right side. Then it means that it opens the, um, it opens the area that you've perforated and then um, brain material will come out of that uh, and cerebrospinal fluid will come out of that perforation. The head will shrink and remember that um, we said that this baby, this head is stuck in the vagina. It's an obstructed labor. The baby is dead and um, the labor has been there for a while. There's a high risk for infection. And you're thinking that it's a bad idea uh, to take this woman for cesarean section because you have um, um, pelvic peritonitis uh, and you have a woman who has a previous caesar now and our women can't easily access cesarean section. She might have a, a rupture uterus in the next pregnancy. So you opt to, to do a destructive uh, delivery. So this is an odom perforator. Maybe you won't see it in your, in your exam or in your OSCE at this level, but it's an instrument that you're going to see uh, in one labor ward or the other. Then this is uh, also something we use for destructive procedures. There's a decapitation saw on the right side and there's a decapitation hook. So I'm going to organize a tutorial for you on maybe like a discussion like this on destructive procedures. So maybe we'll see how these instruments are used in destructive procedures. But the idea is that that wire part of the instrument on the right side goes around the neck of the baby and then you pull, then the head is removed. Then you can deliver the woman. Even the hook there goes around the neck of the baby, then it's pulled. And then once the head is out, sometimes it's easier to, to deliver the baby. So that is a decapitation saw on the right side and the decapitation hook on the, on the left side. Then there's this next instrument here. Again, it's sad that in the labor ward, we keep using wrong instruments. So we have an amniotomy hook there and I've put a slide on the right side on how it's used. So when you are doing artificial rupture of membranes, this is what uh, is the correct instrument to use. Sometimes you can use a caucus a forcep, which we'll see later to use to rupture the membranes. But this is the correct instruments to rupture membranes when a woman is in labor and you want to do ARM for various indications. We know the penguin sucker and we know the, uh, the suction bulb, all these are, these ones are used for neonatal resuscitation for the same uh, purpose. Then the cord clamp is there. You need to identify it and you need to know where it is clamped. So usually we say it is clamped three to four centimeters from the, from the point of insertion. So just in case somebody asks, where do you normally clamp the cord when you have a, a cord clamp in your, in your OSCE exam? Then we have your delivery, vacuum delivery instruments. Uh, again, this is one of the things we'll talk about uh, in the other presentation. You have your vacuum delivery instrument on the left side. This is a manual one, but if you go to a labor ward like uh, UTH and Levy, you find an electrical one like the one on the right. This is just um, a vacuum delivery machine or instrument. Then we know what a babcock is. You need to know that it's used for holding on to tubes. We usually use it to hold on to tubes that we don't want to injure. So you can see it's so smooth. It looks so gentle for you uh, to handle the tubes. So fallopian tubes, ureters, when you are operating, uh, this is the instrument you'd normally use or any other. Some people use it on bowel as well when you don't want to injure the bowel. You want an instrument that is gentle on tube-like tube um, organs. 
So that's a babcock. Then this is a valsellum. Um, you know, the way to identify it is that it has this rat kind of tooth, like three on one side and four on the other. And then it has a lock on the handle there. And also when you lock it, it has that gap in front, which doesn't close. So even if the teeth close, there's that gap in between, in between there. So that's a valsellum that we should know also. This is a common one. This is a malleable retractor. This is a kind of a retractor that is straight. It looks like a ruler. So when you see it in your exam, it will be like a ruler on the table. So it's a retractor. It's called a malleable retractor or some people call it a shoe. Just shoe in terms of the normal shoe. So that is the instrument that you use. So when you are suturing like the skin, you put it, you have finished your scissor, you are suturing the skin, you put it under, under that incision so that you don't injure organs below as you suture the, the skin and so on. So that's a malleable retractor, it looks like a ruler. Then this is a uterine sound. The only thing you need to be able to know to identify a uterine sound is that um, it has graduations. If you see any instrument like this and it doesn't have these numbers on it, then it's not a uterine sound. Maybe it's a, a bladder sound. A bladder sound doesn't have these numbers, but it looks similar to, to this. So you have a uterine sound and you have a bladder sound which looks similar. But the difference is that a uterine sound has graduations so that we can measure the length of the and the size of the uterus. That is why it has those graduations and that's why that's the main reason we use it to feel what's inside the uterus. Sometimes you can sound the uterus when you have like a missing IUCD to just feel where it is. You see it's blunt at the top so that you can't injure the uterus, you can't perforate. So this is a sound. You use it, you use it to measure the size of the uterus and also to, to feel what's inside the uterus. Then you have a curate. Curates are of two types. You have um, sharp curates and uh, blunt curates. So this is just an example there to curate the uterus. Um, when you have uh, taking a biopsy of the endometrium, you are suspecting endometrial cancer. Sometimes when we have a molar pregnancy, after we do an MVA, we, we curate a little bit to get a sample for histopathology. When we are suspecting gestation or trophoblastic uh, neoplasia. Uh, people used to use this instrument for, uh, for removal of retained products of conception in incomplete abortion, but it's discouraged these days because of the high risk of perforation and because of uh, the high risk of um, Asherman syndrome when you overcurate. So you, you end up scraping off the whole endometrium and then there is a scarring of the uterus inside. So that's the main reason this is not used uh, commonly uh, for incomplete abortion and even molar pregnancy right now. It's because of the fear of overcurating, because this is a metal and also um, risking the woman for um, Asherman syndrome. Then we know what a seam speculum is. Ideally, a seam speculum is, is a posterior vaginal wall retractor. It's not an anterior wall vaginal retractor. It's a posterior wall vaginal retractor. So this is an anterior vaginal wall retractor. It looks like a curate, but it's not a curate. This instrument is there and on our labor words, you might just bump into it in your exam, but just see something that looks like a curate. It has these uh, demarcations on the top at the, and at the bottom, and it doesn't have where to curate. You might use it for curating, but this is not a curate. It's, a, it's an anterior vaginal wall retractor. Then this is a lateral vaginal wall retractor, as you can see. So when you want to have a good look at the cervix, you can just retract the sides. And if you are operating, you don't want the vaginal walls collapse. So if you put a retractor like this one on the left and the right side, then open it, then you can do your procedure without the vagina getting in the way of the procedure. Kind of like, um, a self-retaining. So this is a type of a self-retaining vaginal retractor. Because when you look at retractors, there are two types of retractors that you are going to see. You have self-retaining retractors and you have um, 
those manual retractors, retractors that you have to hold on to all the time. So this is an example of a self-retaining uh, vaginal wall retractor. So that's about that one. So I think it's clear how that should be used. Then we have, this is an Alvard um, speculum. So this is another retractor that is self-retaining. So we put it in the vagina, there's a weight. It's very characteristic. There's a weight down there. It pulls um, the vagina down so that you have space when you're operating. We use this commonly when we're doing vaginal hysterectomies. When we are using, we are doing fistula surgeries. This is a very uh, commonly used um, instrument. So this is an Alvard speculum. Then we all know what a casco is. A casco is used to, when you are doing a procedure that you need to visualize the cervix. So any procedure that you need to clearly just visualize the cervix without anything getting in the way, um, you use a casco speculum. So this is a bivalve speculum. That's another, another name. And it's also self-retaining. So once you put it in, you don't need to hold it, hold on to it for it, for it to be in place. So it's a self-retaining bivalve retractor or bivalve speculum or a casco speculum, if you like. Then these are blade handles. Um, there's another name for a blade handle. It's a, a, a bad packer. So it's called a bad packer, but it's also acceptable uh, to call it a blade handle. This is where we put the blade and then we do our surgery. Then this is a needle holder. You can see that it's long on the other side. The handle is really long. And then the part which you use to hold the needle is quite small. That is one um, identifying feature for a for a needle holder um, or a, a needle driver. Some, other, some people call it a needle driver. You can call it a needle driver or you can call it a needle holder. It's just preference. Then of course, these are just towel clips. When we drape the patient, we don't want towels to be moving around. We use these clips to hold the towels in place on the patient. Then this is a caucus. We already talked about a caucus, something you use to hold on to tough tissues. Um, you know, vaginal tissue. Um, uh, we use it for artificial rupture of membranes. We use it to hold on to the vault of the uterus during hysterectomy. This is a caucus. It's used for holding on to tough tissues. Then this is a pipel. A pipel is used for do, getting an endometrial biopsy. It's an outpatient procedure. Patients come to the clinic, we do an endometrial biopsy. You can see the way it is shaped. It is shaped like the cannula for an MVA, but it's a small one. So you can see there's a hole in front there, the way an MVA cannula looks like, but this is a very tiny uh, thing. So this is a pipel. It is used for getting an endometrial biopsy. So you insert it in the cervix, you scrape, and then the sample will be coming inside the pipel. Then these are Hager dilators used to dilate the cervix when you want to access the uterus, but the cervix is closed. So you go from the smallest one, I think which is size three, up to the, to the biggest one. So this is, um, these are Hager dilators. Uh, for medical students, when you say dilators, that's adequate as well. Then this is a metal catheter. Also, we use this when we are doing fistula. You put it in the, in the bladder and it connects to the vagina. You can see it coming out through the vagina as a way to demonstrate um, um, a fistula. It's also used to, if somebody has like bladder stones and you put a metal catheter there, you can see the metal catheter uh, hitting the, the stone. So you can hear that sound. And then you can determine also that this is a this is a bladder stone that is in there. So it's a common instrument that is used to drain the bladder. Even when we are doing DNC uh, procedure, we usually would drain the bladder with a metal catheter and then continue with the procedure. So that's how a metal catheter is normally used. So this is not an indwelling catheter. So you put it in. Once the urine is out, you remove it. You don't keep it in the bladder. Then we know what the vacuum aspirator is. We've spent a lot of time on it. Then this is an Alice forcep also for holding on uh, to tough tissues. It's something that is commonly used. All you have to, to do is identify it when, when you see it. And I've put several pictures there to assist you 
But uh, I must say that, you know, it's ideal to have uh, these um, instrument be seen on the word. So this acts as a stimulation for you to see them on the word so that you can identify them. So because it's no use identifying them on a picture, when you are on the word, you fail to identify it. Then this is uh, a little wood. It's also used in the same way like the Alice uh, to hold on to tough tissues. Um, when we are doing hysterectomy, normally we use this to hold on to the vault of the uterus before we suture it. Then we have the sponge holding forceps. You can also call them ring, ring forceps. So we use them sometimes when we are, we want to hold on to soft tissues. So when you are suturing the cervix after a delivery, you don't use those uh, strong instruments because they will tear the cervix. You would use a sponge holding forceps when you're doing a cervical tear repair after delivery. Then this is a Cheeto forcep. We use it to pick up instruments. It's sterile, so you don't want to pick up instruments that you are giving to theater staff or somebody who's performing a procedure with your bare hands. So a Cheeto forcep is used to, to do that. One thing that helps you identify a Cheeto forcep is that the fact that it doesn't have a lock. You can see that it doesn't have a lock near the handle there. It's something you open and close, open and close. Um, but without a lock up there. So that's a cheetah forcep. And this is an artery forcep. We see this all the time, or they are called hemostats. They are used in surgery to, to achieve hemostasis. So when there's a bleed, an artery is pouring, you just clamp it using this, um, uh, this uh, instrument. So that's an artery forcep. That's an ovum forcep uh, to get um, those tissues outside so when you have retained products of conception inside the uterus, you can use an ovum forceps to remove them, those big things, remove the big tissues. You can also use a, a sponge holding forceps to remove the big uh, tissues uh, from the uterus before you actually perform an MVA. And then you have the green Armitage forcep. This is sub, uh, usually used in C-section to clamp the angles of the uterus uh, before suturing. They are soft, they don't crush the uterus, uh, too much, but they are able to stop the bleeding. Then you have this uterine artery forcep. These are used to clamp on the uterine arteries when we are trying to isolate them and tie them during a uh, hysterectomy. So this is a uterine artery forcep. So if you've done or observed the hysterectomy, you will see this um, instrument there. Then we have a lot of retractors here. Retractors are just used to bring tissues out of the way when somebody is operating. So we have a doyen commonly used for C-section. We have a Morris at the beginning there. So the first one is a Morris. The second one is a doyen. The third one is a um, diva. A diva retractor has a question mark uh, kind of shape. So you shouldn't miss that. And then the last one is a London um, uh, retractor. The right angled retractor. That's what the other name for it right angled retractor. Then we have uh, a Balfour. This is a Balfour retractor, it's self-retaining. When we are doing a laparotomy and you want a retractor that is self-retaining, you don't have to have people pulling this side all the time, they get tired. So you put something there that will remain uh, throughout the procedure without anyone trying to pull it here and there. We can see it has a, it has a doyen there in the middle. Uh, incorporated into it. So this is a bow for retractor. It's there in the theater. You all just have to see them. These are just scissors, Mayo and um, Metalzabam scissors. Uh, so all you have to say here is that the left one is really a dissecting scissors when you want to dissect somewhere and the ones on the right really, uh, maybe you want to cut something and so on. These are dissecting forceps. We all know them holding on to tissue as we are suturing or as we are dissecting. Then we have these um, speculums. So this is an insulated speculum. It's a casco, but it's insulated. The blue is to insulate. We use this when we are doing lips. You know, when we are screening for cervical cancer, um, we use, we use, um, we use a, a, a speculum of this kind. You see there's this part here, um, which is used to evacuate smoke because when we are doing a leap, we are doing like we are cauterizing the cervix, we are cauterizing the abnormal tissue. So smoke might be coming out. So with that, we use that 
place there that looks like a tube uh, to be able to evacuate the smoke. And then since we are using electricity, uh, we don't want the woman to be electrocuted. That's why the, this speculum is coated blue to insulate it so that you don't electrocute or burn the woman when you are doing a leap because you are cauterizing the cervix and there's heat there. So you don't want that heat to go there. Then this, this is the instrument used to actually cut the cervix. So to cut the abnormal part of the cervix. So after you do cervical uh, cancer screening with, um, you know, these days we are using visual inspection with acetic acid, we see the aceto white lesions, and then we cut out um, the area that is abnormal. So this is called a loop electrode. It's the one we are using to cut through the abnormal parts of the cervix um, so that the abnormal part is removed and so on. So this is a loop electrode. So it's something we use in cervical cancer, in cervical cancer screening to remove the abnormal parts of the cervix. Then this is a bore electrode. Once you cut with a loop electrode, sometimes there's a bleed, there are bleeding parts. So you use this to, to go to those bleeding parts. You, that silver part is hot. So you go there, the silver and bore part is hot. Uh, the, the silver part on the left side is connected to electricity. So you are, you are touching gently the parts that are bleeding to stop the bleeding. So this is a bore electrode. Then uh, this is a punch biopsy forcep also used in cervical cancer issues. So when you see an abnormal lesion on the cervix, you cut or you punch that area to get for biopsy. So this, this is a punch biopsy uh, forcep. Then this is a myoma screw. When we are doing a myomectomy, um, we screw this thing with this uh, thing into the myoma to try and remove it and dissect around it. We also use this uh, instrument to be able to hold to the hold on to the uterus when we are removing it, so that you have one instrument that you are using to put traction on the uterus as you are operating. So it would be, I'm sure some of you have already seen this instrument in theater during hysterectomy and during myomectomy. So this is a myoma screw. Then these ones are also used for cervical cancer screening, but this is for pap smear. So when you're using a pap smear, you use these instruments. So you can see they are pointed in front so you can enter the cervix and rotate these brushes and get some cells on the brushes and put them on the slide. Then even the, uh, the other one, um, this one here, this wooden one and the other ones, we use them for the same reason. So one part, it has those areas which are like bifurcating in front. So one part goes in the cervix, then you just rotate it through the cervix. So it gets a sample and then you can put that sample on a slide. So these are pap smear uh, gadgets. So you have um, an Aries spatula, which is like that wooden one and that plastic one. And then you have the brushes, which are obvious. They are called cyto brushes because they are removing cells from the, from the cervix. Then this is a uterine elevator. It's an instrument you put in the uterus and you can manipulate the uterus. Sometimes when you are doing a BT, a bilateral tubal ligation, it's very difficult to find the uterus because the incision is small. So if you put this in the cervix vaginally, then somebody can push, can manipulate the uterus from the vaginal area to, to make access of the uterus easy for the surgeon. So there, that is called the uterine elevator. Then uh, this one is an intrauterine cannula. This is common. Uh, we use it when we are doing um, um, HSG, hysterosalpingogram. So you insert this thing and screw it in the cervix, and then you insert the contrast through it. Then you can take pictures by X-ray, and then you get your hysterosalpingogram. So that's about this instrument. Then these are just suction tips that you see in the, when you put a suction during a theater, you have to connect something to be able to suck properly. So these are suction tips just. Uh, this is a diathermy pencil. We all know what it is for cauterizing. Um, then we have the laryngoscope. These are, um, you be, should be able to identify it, of course. 
then you should be able to identify bug and mask and the parts of the bug and mask uh, system. Then this is an endotracheal tube. You should be able to identify it easily during your OSCE exam. Then this is an oropharyngeal airway. You should also be able to identify this easily in your exam. So that is that. I think that's the last. Okay, there's a spinal needle. Um, this is what we are using to inject in the spine for those procedures, C-sections. Anytime you have to do a spinal anesthesia, this is the spinal needle that is being used. And then this is a pudendal block needle. It's kind of similar to a spinal needle, but a bit different. To do a pudendal block, to uh, to for anesthesia when you're doing uh, like uh, obstetric vaginal procedures. So that was the last slide. Uh, we only have a minute, uh, so it's going to go off. So what you need to do is just uh, those who have time log in again. Maybe we can uh, discuss any questions you have. Then we can uh, we can move on to the uh, to the next one. So that was about surgical instruments. Just uh, be able to go through this. I'll share the slides and try to memorize as many slides as you can, as many instruments as you can, and more importantly, have a look at them on the word. Uh, then you have a feel and touch, and then it's easier. So let's. Login on the other side. Is everyone still here?